God used to dwell in a house among his people. But now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he's making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can live. Brick after brick. Preparing our hearts and our minds for God's word this morning. We are going to be taking our reading from Proverbs, the second chapter, and I'm reading and beginning at verse 6. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity, and every good path. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you, understanding will keep you, to deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things. I want to speak this morning from the subject of the weapon of wisdom, the weapon of wisdom. I love speaking on the topic of faith, one of my favorite topics. Next to that, I would say, is the subject of wisdom. I love speaking about that because the word has so, so much to say about wisdom. I want to start off with the scripture that says God gave Solomon very great wisdom and understanding and knowledge as vast as the sands of the seashore. That triad of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge appears quite frequently. We read it throughout the scriptures in this chapter, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Even in the New Testament, Paul makes a prayer. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. So we see that often clustered together, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom in various arrangements. Knowledge is the acquisition or the gathering of information. It's learning, it's collecting data. In Revelation, it says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Now he's speaking about the book of Revelation, but it's certainly applicable to all of the Bible. There's a blessing in reading, hearing, and keeping. You would note it doesn't even say to those who understand, but to those who read. That's why reading the Bible is so important, and it's discouraging when I hear people who say, well, I can't understand the Bible. Understanding comes from God, but it's for you to gather and acquire knowledge. Hosea says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. 
because you have rejected knowledge. Proverbs says, even zeal, ambition, is not good without knowledge. And one who acts hastily sins. Paul would cite this verse in his writings in Romans. For I testify about them, referring to Israel, that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. So knowledge is the acquisition of information. Understanding is making sense of what you know. It's making sense of that information. Daniel, when he received one of his revelations, he says, although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Here, Daniel receives the knowledge, but he doesn't have the understanding, and he pursues God for that. So understanding is making sense of what you know. On an occasion, Jesus went on to say, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. So understanding is making sense of the knowledge you receive. And then there is wisdom. And the scriptures, again, say so much about wisdom. Proverbs tells us wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Another version says wisdom is supreme. Another translation says, getting wisdom is the most important thing. Wisdom is chief. Wisdom is a priority. Wisdom is at the top of the list. It is the principal thing. When we turn to Corinthians, and Paul's expounding on the gifts of the Spirit, when he lists all of the gifts, it is no surprise that at the top of that list is word of wisdom. Because it's the principal thing. It's the most important thing. Now, I like to talk about what wisdom is not. Wisdom is not simply being smart. Many people think wisdom is all about being educated having a degree. And education is good and degrees are fine. But there are a lot of people that are well educated and have no sense at all. Don't look around. (laughs) Education is important, but that's no guarantee for wisdom. Now the scriptures also speak about two types of wisdom. There is the wisdom of the world and there is the wisdom of God. In 1 Corinthians, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Again, yet when I am among mature believers, I do speak with words of wisdom but not the kind of wisdom that belongs to this world. So there is a vast difference between the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world. Wisdom is the ability to anticipate a consequence. It could be a bad consequence. It can be a good consequence. But wisdom is the ability to foresee what comes next. A prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. 
Wisdom will cause you to stop and think, if I do this, what is going to be the likely result? How many times have we found ourselves in circumstances and we bang our heads against a wall and we say, we ask, what was I thinking? You did not anticipate the likelihood of your actions. Wisdom does not always come with age. It is often thought that the older you get, the wiser you get. And that's not necessarily the case. There are plenty of people that lived their entire life and never had any wisdom. Job says great men are not always wise, nor do the aged always understand justice. Another translation says age is no guarantee of wisdom and understanding. Wisdom does not always come with experience. I've often found people who assume that if somebody's been in a bad situation, been through a divorce, been through some kind of a crisis, that they're the people to talk to. They know because they've been through it. That's not necessarily the case. Just because your house burnt down doesn't mean you know how to put out fires. It doesn't make you a fireman. It doesn't give you the skills necessary. It just means you went through a bad experience. And we find many people who go through experience after experience making the same mistakes over and over again. They're married to a loser, get divorced, they marry another loser. Get divorced and marry another loser. A lot of experience, but still no wisdom. Experience is no proof of wisdom. Don't feel you, because you haven't experienced every particular kind of crisis, that there is no wisdom for you. I have a pet, an alligator, but I have enough sense to not try. So experience does not necessarily guarantee you wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference. This is so key and vital. When you think about it, the book of Proverbs is nothing but a book of difference. It lists various differences on various topics. It tells us a wise man regards sin this way. Foolish people regard sin that way. Wise people will handle drinking this way. Foolish people handle drinking that way. Wise people go through trials this way. Foolish people understand trials that way. Wise people do this with their money. Foolish people will do that with their money. It's nothing but a book of difference. Wisdom is the ability to recognize the difference. We're all familiar with AA, the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That interestingly also is written by Reinhold Niebuhr, who happens to be a Christian theologian. So wisdom is the ability to recognize difference, the difference in people, in personalities. Who is in your life? Do you understand the people that you choose to include and have in your life? There are people who God assigned into your life, and there are people that you allowed into your life, and they're not necessarily the same. 
Do you recognize who God has put into your life versus people that you just will not let go of, that you hang on to because you fail to recognize the difference that that person is making in your life. Wisdom does not come by association. Jacob and Esau had the same father, yet one was blessed and one ended up cursed. Solomon and Absalom had the same father, King David, yet one became king, one became a rebel. Peter and Judas had the same teacher. They had the same mentor. One became a great apostle, the other became a traitor. It is not enough that you go to the right church. It is not enough that you simply know a right person. You have to be able to recognize the difference in the people, recognize the difference in the environment, and then make the appropriate choices for your life. I know people that are in the wrong church today, under the wrong kind of leadership. And they know that, they can acknowledge that, and their response is, I'm waiting for God to move me. You don't need to wait for God to move you. You need to recognize difference and walk in wisdom and make healthy choices. Last week we talked about spiritual maturity. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. He says, when I became a man, I put away childish things. They didn't go away by themselves. I made the necessary choices to put away childish things. For Paul, maturity and spiritual maturity, childishness, had everything to do with how you speak, how you understand, and how you think. It doesn't even say how you act, which certainly applies, but how you act is based on how you think, how you understand. Spiritual maturity has to affect those things how you speak, how you understand, and how you think. Let's look back in the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. When man fell from the good grace of God and ended up in a sinful state, we read there, but the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The response here launches an almost comical conversation about blame and passing the buck. And it starts with Adam. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. What Adam is saying, Lord, actually you did this. You gave me this woman. Think about it. Adam didn't ask for Eve. That was God's idea. From Adam's perspective, you did it. I was fine before you decided 
I needed Eve, and now she has brought this upon me. Passing the blame, shunning his responsibility. And so he blames the woman. He then turns to the woman, and the woman passes the blame. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So Adam's blaming Eve. Eve is blaming the serpent. And none of this is their fault. And this was not an excuse. Because then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So if you have any creeps in your life, you have power over them. <laughs> Adam and Eve were given power and dominion and authority over all of the animals. So to say that the serpent deceived me was not acceptable because they had the authority over the serpent. And they should have rebuked him and scolded him and resisted him, but they didn't. Why? So what happened in the garden? How did this happen? Well, we have some information. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Another translation says the serpent was more cunning. Another translation says the serpent was more shrewd. So the serpent used its wisdom to beguile and deceive Eve. In other words, the serpent outwised Adam and Eve. And so we see the power and the weapon of wisdom, in this case used for evil. Now, God says, if you do not have wisdom, ask God for it. He is always ready to give it to you and will never say you're wrong for asking. This is one of the most gracious, powerful verses regarding wisdom because what it means is God will never say no to any request for wisdom. When you ask God for wisdom, he will never respond I don't think you need that now. He will always be ready to give it to you. This is where Adam and Eve failed. And so they were out wise. How does one ask for wisdom? There is a story in, we find in Chronicles where there was an occasion when they sought the Lord for his wisdom. Israel finds themselves in a battle Second Chronicles 20, verse 10, but here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us from coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. We don't know what to do, Lord, but our eyes are on you. You can guide us through this. You can give us the wisdom to do the right thing. Show me 
the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. It's when we turn to God in serenity and say, Lord, I don't know how to handle this, but I'm leaning on you to bring me through it. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. We need to see wisdom as not just answers to complicated questions, but wisdom is a weapon that will cause us to conquer all of our enemies. It will cause us to conquer what we can't do for ourselves. Wisdom will cause us to make the decisions necessary to break the chains. When we rely on God, when we rely on God to bring us through, when we find ourselves in circumstances that we have no control of, that's the time to lean on God and say, Lord, show me the way out of this. Lord, I've been doing this for my own a long time and have gotten nowhere. Lord, I need you to take me by the hand and show me which way to go. And if you lean on God, he'll open up your understanding. He'll show you what eyes have not seen. He'll show you what ears have not heard. He'll make a way where there is no way and you'll find yourself at the bottom of the pit and God will give you the wisdom to rise above it. He'll give you wisdom to conquer temptation. He'll give you the wisdom to deal with your misfortunes of your messed up relationships. He'll show you a way out. Lord, give me wisdom. Lord, I want to trust in the Lord with all all my heart and lean not on my own understanding but in all my ways acknowledge him and he'll direct my paths he'll raise me up he'll take me higher he'll bring me through use the weapon of wisdom brick after brick God is building his temple brick after brick he's making it strong with Christ the sure foundation Place he can.